We're continuing this series of messages on the revelatory ministry of the miracles of Christ. It is in the miracles of Christ you see something about Christ and he unveils his great salvation to us. I'm covering these miracles for a variety of reasons. One is that I think it's important that everyone's familiar mm -hmm. with the, the miracles that Jesus performed, or that he wrought, that they're not strange to you. <clears throat> and secondly, the miracles of Christ are like seeds of a truth, and if you take them into your heart, they'll grow and mm -hmm. blossom and flourish, and you'll mm -hmm. see a lot about Christ in them. <clears throat> in Christ's miracles, you'll see become acquainted with his nature the kind of people he responded to, and how no circumstance was beyond his, uh, his power and ability. He also confirmed the, this quality of divine compassion. And that's important in the time of need to see that he's compassionate, the Lord is mm -hmm. compassionate. And they teach us how to seek the Lord, to kind of give an index as to how to approach the Lord, that it's not always just in a purely intellectual way that Sometimes you can approach Christ just because you see some aspect of him and you, you come and appeal to him on the basis of that. And we're going to see something of that uh, tonight. A man that was convinced that Jesus could do something and he approached about just purely on that basis. Mm -hmm. There was a particular protocol he followed. There wasn't any precedent for what he asked for. There, mm -hmm. there wasn't any precedent for this, but he pressed in for it anyway. <clears throat> and it's Christ uh, healing of a certain leper. This is at the four forefront of his ministry early on in it. <clears throat> I'm going to read uh, three accounts of this, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of them give this account. And then we'll dissect it and see what we can find here. <clears throat> Matthew's account of this uh, incident is found in the eighth chapter in the first four verses. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him, and behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will. Be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Mark's account is found in the first chapter of Mark, verses 40 through 44. There came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will. Be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, Immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And straightly he straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away. And saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Luke's account is found in the fifth chapter of Luke. Begin at verse 12. It came to pass, when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who, seeing Jesus, mm -hmm. fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will. Be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. And he charged him to tell no man, but go show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing according as Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. <clears throat> now, this event took place right after the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew talks about the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, those three chapters. Matthew 5, 1 tells us, Seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, 
His disciples came to him, and that's what the Beatitudes were given and all manner of instruction in the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. Then in our event, Matthew 8, 1, which immediately follows chapter 7, which was the last of the Sermon on the Mount, says when he was come down from the mountain. So he just got through teaching on the mountain. He came down. Here was this, uh, here was this leper that, that met him. We also learn from Mark that he had been teaching in the synagogues about this time. Mark 1.39 says he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. And the next verse tells about this, about this leper. So it was a notice there's two teaching contexts. Context. First is the in the mountain and in some place in between there he was in the synagogues teaching too. We also learned from Luke that it was in a certain city. So it wasn't like it on a wide open field. In a certain city. It said it came to pass when he was in a certain city. Behold, a man full of leprosy came to him. So what do you get a picture of all of that? Well, if you want Christ to do something for you, you've got to get where he's working. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus did come to the people, I understand. For the most part, these people all came to him. There are some cases that were so bad that Jesus had to come to them, like Lazarus. He had, he, he, he had to go to Lazarus, mm -hmm. raise him from the dead. But most of the cases, they came to him. Now, you might, it might surprise you how many people want Jesus to do something for them, but they never get where Jesus is, mm -hmm. or where he's working, or where he's teaching. Or where he's where he's expounding, or where he's opening up the things of God, and then they kind of they kind of marvel because they never get anything from Jesus. Well, this is why you've got to get where Jesus is if you want a blessing from Him. Amen. Now, as he comes down here from the mountain, all of a sudden it said multitudes. One text says multitudes followed him, but here one man surfaces. The Holy Spirit draws attention on one man out of this, how big this multitude was, we don't know, but multitudes followed him. And you kind of get a picture of multitudes when you're over there in the Middle East. It'll defy, redefine for you what a multitude is. It's not people standing on the square down in Joplin. It's a little bit bigger than that, uh -huh. I will tell you. But this one person surfaces in the midst of this multitude. Matthew said, Behold, there came a leper. And he rises to the occasion. This man seemed to see more than the other people saw. Now, they'd heard Jesus teach. But this man saw something that the other people didn't see. And so he got something the other people didn't get. Amen. That's the way Christ works. Amen. He confronted this leper. Now the Luke tells us that he was this is a bad case of leprosy. Luke 5, 12 says he was full of leprosy. So he, he was in an advanced stage. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just beginning. Quite a situation. <clears throat> now let's take a moment here and, and say a little something about leprosy before Jesus. Because there wasn't a lot of instruction about this. There weren't a lot of examples of lepers. He couldn't look at a book in the local uh, the local Jewish Bible bookstore and find a history of how God treated lepers. I mean, there wasn't a lot about this available. This man's not thinking about a precedent. If he had a precedent for what he's going to do, he just saw Jesus and he knew this This is not your normal man. This, That's right. this isn't like the scribe and you don't ask an extraordinary Savior for ordinary things. Uh -huh. Sometimes people, they, they spend too much time asking Jesus for ordinary things. He'd go down to the grocery store and pick them up. And they don't, well, they don't take capitalize on his great power. Now there's, uh, there were some lepers, notable lepers in the Bible. There were places where lepers lived. They were just isolated off and lived by themselves. But there are a few lepers we know by name that were in the Bible. The first, first account of leprosy that we actually read about was Moses' sister, Miriam. Mm -hmm. Moses' sister, Miriam, and Moses' brother, Aaron, they appear both to have been older than Moses, 
Well, we know that Miriam was older because she took care of him when he was a babe in a basket floating in the river. Yeah. Moses married a, an Ethiopian. Mm -hmm. And it, it aggravated Miriam and Aaron. And they criticized Moses. And God struck Miriam with leprosy because they did. She got this dose of leprosy. Quite, a, quite an occasion. I want to read uh, read what happened here. <clears throat> this is Numbers 12 and verse 10. They criticized Moses, verse 9 and 10. Here's what Numbers 12 and 9 says. The anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. That explains a lot of things, you know? This explains a lot of things. Have you ever been someplace that was a religious place, but you just couldn't sense God was there at all? And have you ever wondered why? It's because he left. Mm -hmm. Ichabod yeah. is the word. The glory has departed. Verse 10, And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow, and Aaron looked upon Miriam, his sister, and behold, she was leprous. Well, I don't know if this leper knew about Miriam or not, but this is one of the first instances of leprosy in the Bible. You might remember that Moses prayed for her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Lord, the Lord took it away. Another case of leprosy found in 2 Kings is Naaman. He, was a, he wasn't a Jew, he was a Syrian. In fact, Jesus referred to Naaman the leper in a synagogue when he was preaching one day. He says, there were many lepers in Israel. But God didn't heal any of them. He healed a Syrian, this Gentile leper. And it, it upset the people in the synagogue that he said it. But here's the instance. You remember Naaman the leper. He didn't, he didn't know about the God of Israel, but he had a maid, a little Jewish maid that worked for him. And this little maid told him that there was a prophet in Israel that knew a God that could deal with this leprosy that he had. This little girl told him. And he went down there and inquired and, and uh, it was Elijah the prophet and he didn't even come out. He, he didn't even come out to talk to Naaman. He just sent his servant out told him to go down and dip in the river Jordan seven times. Ooh, it made Naaman man. Said the scripture says he thought he'd come and strike his hand. Mm -hmm. Kind of like you see on a TV. <laughs> strike his hand over him. Some great display of power. And so this, this his servant said, Well, if, if he'd asked you to do some great thing, you'd have done it. This looks like that's pretty easy to do. Why don't you just go down there? And he said, Well, there's a lot of rivers. We got clean rivers in Syria. The Jordan is a dirty, muddy river. Well, he finally, he did it. He went down to the River Jordan, and here's what the, what the, what the Scripture says, that uh, he dipped in the River Jordan seven times, and the seventh time he came up clean, and his flesh was all restored. Well, that was Naaman the leper. Another example of leprosy was uh, the Elisha's, Elisha, I think I said Elijah, Elisha, his servant, Eli, uh, Ahazi, uh, Naaman offered to pay a, a lot of change of garments, a new wardrobe, offered the prophet a new wardrobe. And the prophet said, no, he wouldn't take anything. And Ge Gehazi uh, ran after him and he coveted that wardrobe. He said, oh, well, he said, I'm, why don't you let me have these several changes of clothes? And, and so he did. And what God said to Gehazi, the leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee. And to thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. So here's Gehazi, his whole, all the generations after him were lepers. I don't know if the fellow here that's on the TV that reverses generational curses, you think he could have solved this? Huh? Is there anyone dumb enough to think that that curse could be reversed? Hmm? There's really a lot of malarkey that's being taught today. If you just, I don't, I don't advise you to listen to it all the time, but here's, you couldn't averse this. 
Amen. Perhaps there's some curses in the world today that are similar to this. That uh -huh. It's just something men can't deal with. That's all. Mm -hmm. So it's Gehazi. And then there was another leper by the name of, of uh, Azariah. He was a king. And he went out from the Lord a leper because he had been unfaithful. God made him a leper, and he was a leper all his life, too. There was another one, Uzziah, the king. Uzziah the king offered incense before the Lord, and he wasn't authorized to offer incense before the Lord. This is found in 2 Chronicles 26.20. Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him, that's Uzziah, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they thrust him out from thence. Yea, he himself hastened also to go up, because the Lord had smitten him. And Uzziah the king was a leper till the day of his death, and dwelt in a several or separate house, being a leper, and he was cut off from the house of the Lord. <laughs> what a case. This king that was stricken with leprosy is found in 1 Kings 15.5. The Lord smote the king so that he was a leper unto the day of his death. Mm -hmm. Now these are the kind of, this. if this man that came to Jesus was a leper and knew, and knew the Bible of his day, this is the kind of, this is the kind of information he had. Yeah. Could you, uh, you imagine what the devil could do with something like this, with a leper? Could you imagine? You must have a curse upon you. There's no hope for you. Get away from the people. Quite a quite a statement. Yeah. Lepers, of course, were isolated in the under the law. They couldn't dwell among the people. They had to be external to the people. Leviticus 13:46 says, "All the days wherein the plague shall be in in him, he shall be defiled. He's unclean. He shall dwell alone." Without or outside the camp shall his habitation be. He can't live in the neighborhood. He can't be among the people. Mm -hmm. Got to be out separate. Numbers 5.2 says, Command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper. Get, get him out. This man knew if he knew scripture, this is, the, this is the kind of thing he had. And Jesus has been with the people up in the mount. He's been with the people up in the mount, teaching. And Luke says he was in a certain city. Here comes this leper. This is right violation of what the law said. Yeah. You want to be a strict legalist, you'd have to, one of the disciples say, hey, hey, hey. Yeah, get away from here. You're not allowed. Right. Close to the master. Showing you here that Satan may give you a hundred reasons why you can't come to Jesus for help. <laughs> you have to be able to have faith and press through. Amen. Press through anyway. <clears throat> there, are only, there are only two records of lepers being healed, healed prior to Jesus. One was Miriam. One was Naaman. Mm -hmm. That's it. So this was not like a practice that uh, people with which people were familiar. <clears throat> Only two lepers. Now that's what that's the kind of that's the kind of material the man had to work with, if he had access to the, all that was written about it. This is all he had on it. But this leper, let's say, look at his insightful petition. What he did. It's, uh, six things it says he did. First, it says he saw he. He came and worshipped him. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing he did. Matthew 8, 2. He came and worshipped him. How did he worship him? By, he said, and said, If thou wilt, thou can make me clean. Mm -hmm. Mark says, Mark 1, 40 says, He besought Jesus. Mm -hmm. Made a special point to present his supplication. Made an approach to Jesus. A formal like request mm -hmm. of him. And he also says he knelt down when he did it. Mm -hmm. Luke says that when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face. Mm -hmm. Now, we, I think we mentioned this before, but today we've been exposed to a number of uh, uh, pictures, media pictures, about the activity of Muslims as they bow down and worship. And you'll see that they kneel down and then they go on their face. Yeah. 
So this is the, this is the custom. They knelt down and they went prostrate with their knees on the ground, prostrate before him. That's what this leper did. Knelt down, went on his face before the Lord. And then he made an appeal to the Christ's ability, if you will. That is, if we'd say, if you want to. If you want to, you can make me whole. Yeah. So he saw, well, he saw Jesus. He came to Jesus. He worshipped Jesus. He kneeled before Jesus. He fell on his face before Jesus. And he appealed yeah. to Jesus. Well, the question that comes to my mind is, how far would you go yeah. to get something from Jesus? Some people really wouldn't go across the street. Mm -hmm. That's why they don't get anything. <laughs> this man went to quite an extent. He, remember, these Pharisees have been treading along following Jesus, so they could sure find fault with this, and the procedure wasn't right. This, was, this wasn't a correct procedure. It sure wasn't according to the law. Mm -hmm. How far will you go, and how would you dare to go against religious custom? Yeah. Maybe to get what you need from the Lord. <clears throat> Now let's look at this a little further. <clears throat> says that Jesus put forth his hand. Matthew says he put forth his hand and touched him. Mark says the same thing. Luke says the same thing. All three of them make a point. He touched him. Yeah. <laughs> now this is a stark contradiction of the law. Amen. The law said you couldn't touch a leper or anybody with an issue mm -hmm. who had a fleshly disorder. You couldn't do it without becoming unclean yourself. But mm -hmm. Jesus touched him. He wasn't a slave to the law. Mm -hmm. We found something else in Mark 1.41. He was moved with compassion mm -hmm. on this man. If you've ever seen a leper, I've seen lepers. In fact, I have a picture of a leper I became a friend with in India. They're not pleasant to look at. Mm -hmm. Not at all. They're rather of a hideous nature. It's a sort of a disease that is, would be repulsive to normal people, but Jesus who had compassion, it touched Jesus mm -hmm. to see this man. If you're going to have, a, if you're going to come to Jesus, you've got to see this aspect of Christ's nature mm -hmm. that everybody else may be repulsed by your condition, <laughs> but Jesus can be moved by compassion with it. And Jesus said to him, all three writers say the same thing, exactly the same words: "I will." Be thou clean. Mm -hmm. Now at this point, it's going to become an acid test as to whether Christ is divine or not. Whether he has divine qualities or not. Mm -hmm. We know from scripture that God can do what he wants. Yeah. Amen. Well, he does what he wants. Mm -hmm. Let's see what the scripture says about this. So this is going to be a test now whether this is really, whether he's really from God or not. Mm -hmm. Whether God's really in him or not. Psalm 115.3 says, Our God is in heaven, in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he has pleased. That, yeah. That's a divine prey. Mm -hmm. God does what he wants and yeah. you can't change it. Nobody can change it. Satan can't change it. Principalities and powers can't change it. If all the forces of hell assaulted God, they couldn't change it. If the earth said weak, they tried to change it, you can't change it. He does what he pleases. Right. So I'll tell you. <laughs> That's not all the scripture says about it. Psalm 135, 6 says, Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas, and all deep places. So he's yeah. not... Uh, He's not restrained Amen. by any area. And Jesus said, I will. All right, now we've got to see whether he can do what he wants to do. If he can, then it just remains for you to touch his will. Amen. That's all it remains for you to touch his will. If you can get in his will so that he wills what you need, you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. Make no doubt about this. Amen. Going to get it. Here it is again. Daniel 4, 35. All inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. 
He doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth, and none can stay his hand or stop it. Or say unto him, What doest thou? Just challenge him. Nobody, nobody can challenge God. Not even the devil challenges God. He tempted Jesus, but he didn't challenge him. He didn't put up his dukes to Jesus. <laughs> Let me tell you, I think there's a lot of nonsense. There's a lot of nonsense taught about Jesus Christ. Folk fighting Jesus. And Jesus going out and duking it out with them. It's just a lot of nonsense. Mm -hmm. Nobody says to him, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Nobody questions him. When God protected Job, Satan didn't say, why did you do that? He didn't raise his voice. He didn't raise a note of dissent. <clears throat> Not him. Demons didn't. They said, are you here to torment us before the time? But they didn't fuss with Jesus. That's right. You know, you're going to see now whether his will really prevails. Ephesians 1.11 says of God, He works all things after the counsel of His own will. Yeah, yeah. Here's how it works. God doesn't do it unless He wants to. Mm -hmm. And if He wants to, He does. Amen. Yeah. He wanted to send Jesus into this sin-cursed earth. He sent Him in. Satan wanted to take Him out. He couldn't do it. God wanted to raise Jesus from the dead, and He did. Uh -huh. And nobody could stop Him. He could not be held by the grave. It was not possible that He should be holding by death. Yeah. God brought Him up into heaven and exalted Him above every name that's named, not only in this world, but the world to come, and nobody could stop it. Right. God does everything according to His will. See, this is a great consolation now. Mm -hmm. If you come to God with your will being the main thing, don't be expecting to get a lot from Him. You've got to come with His will in mind. You've got to know enough about God to touch His will. Because God does do what He wants to do. Yes. Amen. And if He wants to show mercy, He'll say something like this. I'll show mercy unto whom I'll show mercy. Yes. Amen. If I want to do it, I will. He also said, if I want to harden them, I'll do that too. Boy, I opt for the mercy. Amen. I opt for the mercy. Well, uh, when Jesus said, I will be thou, be thou clean, Matthew says immediately the leprosy was cleansed. <laughs> this, was, this was God manifest in the flesh. And Mark says, as soon as he spoke, yeah. leprosy left. And Luke 5.13 says, immediately the leprosy departed. Mm -hmm. so, so this was, he was everything. He's everything the scripture says he was. Yes, amen. Well, I want you to really to see this. That if you can touch the will of Christ, you'll get what you're seeking. Mm -hmm. if, it, if what you're asking is not like self-centered and revolving around your own... This man was a leper. There's not a thing he could do about this. Nobody else could do anything about it. But he appealed. He said, I know that if you really want to do this, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And that's what touched. Yeah. That's what touched mm -hmm. the heart of Christ. <clears throat> and immediately he was made cleansed. Great, uh, great truth. He did have, still does have divine qualities. Now let's look at the directions that he gave him. <coughs> Mark says he sent him away. So he sent him away. See, cleansing wasn't the end of the matter. There was something else had to be done here. Remember there were one occasion Jesus cleansed ten lepers mm -hmm. and only one came back to give thanks. And Jesus didn't say, well, thank God one came back. He said, where are the nine? I distinctly remember on one occasion I was holding a revival meeting in Oklahoma and it was at a church that it, it was growing quite rapidly. So I asked how many people that they had had become Christians. They baptized that last year and it was several, huh, five, six hundred, something like that. And I asked, well, how many people that have been baptized this year are here today? There was, there was eight. 
there were eight. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, where are the other 492? Right. Where are they? Mm -hmm. That's how Jesus is. So he gives them something to do. First he says, don't tell anybody about this. You'd be surprised how many people are falling because they told their testimony too soon. You ever think about this? Don't tell anybody yet. He didn't mean never tell anybody. He meant there's something to do first. Tell no man. All three gospel writers say this. Matthew says, See, thou tell no man. So you make it your business. Don't tell us to anybody. Mark says, see thou say nothing to any man. Luke says, he charged him to tell no man. So what was he to do? <clears throat> well, he said, go thy way. You're going to give him something to do. He doesn't mean go home and be quiet. That's, <laughs> that isn't what he meant at all. The testimony was too soon. He wanted this man to be confirmed that this is what had happened was real. Mm -hmm. It really happened. Go thy way. There comes a time when you got to enter the mainstream of life in the shape Jesus recreated you in. You've got to get into the warp and woof of life mm -hmm. and go confirm that what's happened to you is genuine. Yeah. That it's not fraudulent. So Jesus said, go your way and show yourself to the priest. You're going to have to go to someone that like, is an expert in this. And the law had spelled out, quite, it's Leviticus chapters 13 and 14. The details are quite, quite extensive. It appears as though they weren't, uh, there's no example of them being used in Scripture. Mm -hmm. It was quite a, elaborate to confirm that a leper had been cleansed. It was quite an extensive procedure, but there's no record of anybody doing it. I can imagine that it would really be a testimony to come to a priest and to say, I'd... I'm a cleansed leper, and, they, and he was from the territory, so I guess they would have known, well, you're so-and-so, but what, what would, would really be a testimony. I, would, see, I better get out the book of Leviticus and brush up on this. We haven't had, a lot of, haven't had a lot of requests for this cleansing of a leper. Leviticus is found in Leviticus, the 13th chapter. I'll read just a few verses of this. The priest had to examine them very carefully. Leviticus 13, 2, When a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab, a bright spot, and it be in the skin of his flesh like a, clep, like a plague of leprosy, then he shall be brought unto the Aaron the priest or unto one of the sons of the priests. And God, if you read the law in detail, he told them how to tell whether it was leprosy or not. They could tell. Verse 3, And the priest shall look on the plague of the skin of the flesh, and when the hairs of the plague is turned white, and the plague is in sight be deeper than the skin of his flesh. It is a plague of leprosy. And the priest shall look upon him and pronounce him unclean. Mm -hmm. So it's something beneath the surface. <laughs> See, leprosy is a type of sin, as you know. Mm -hmm. Sin is like beneath the surface, mm -hmm. not just up on the surface. And the 13th verse of Leviticus 13 says, or well, the 6th verse says, he shall look at him again the seventh day. So he had to sequester him for a little bit, see if this came back or not. Or as some people would say, lost their healing. Have you heard people say about this? And behold, if the plague be somewhat dark, mm -hmm. and the plague spreading out of the skin, the priest should pronounce him clean. It's but a scab. Mm -hmm. So as he would be able to detect whether the leprosy was really gone or not. 17th, 13th verse says, the priest shall consider... And behold, if the leprosy have covered all his flesh, he shall pronounce him clean that hath the plague. It is all turned white, he's clean. So it's, in other words, it's, the flesh is back to normal. Uh -huh. In other words. Verse 17 says, The priest shall see him, and behold, if the plague be turned into white, then the priest shall pronounce him clean that hath the plague. He is clean. Uh -huh. So you had to, this, he said, you go to someone that knows about this. That knows about this. Uh -huh. And let him examine you. Because the work of Christ holds up yeah. under examination. Amen. The person who's been converted will hold up under the test. Yeah. Whether, he's got a, whether he's new or not. <clears throat> Go show yourself to the priest. 
that ceremony was something that was lived out. It was Thanksgiving, lived out. And then the man had to bring a couple of birds, and then they offer a sacrifice it's in praise and thanksgiving that he was cleansed. And one of the birds was killed, and one was let go free, and there was a quite a ceremony that confirmed he was cleansed, and the priest presented him to the congregation. He's clean. So what Jesus is telling this man to do, go back to the priest, let the priest confirm that this is the case, Maybe the man might have had a leprosy on his back and couldn't see it, so the priest's going to examine him thoroughly. Mm -hmm. Clean, then he would present him this. He was once a leper, but now he's clean. Yeah. Official pronouncement. Why should he do this? For a testimony unto them. Yeah. A testimony. Now this is something you can't really make a law about. I understand that. But a person who really is been converted or received a new heart or has put on Christ or their sins have been washed away however you want to phrase it shouldn't be afraid to be put under the microscope mm -hmm. to see if that's really happened mm -hmm. see if the person really knew or not mm -hmm. this is one of the uh, one of the benefits of someone that's uh, like Barnabas when Saul of Tarsus was converted People didn't believe he was converted. They said, we heard about him. Yeah. And he was persecuting the Christians, and Barnabas took him and showed him the leprosy was gone. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Confirmed. See, Barnabas, he said, he told how the Lord appeared to him, and then they, then they received him. But he had to have someone else had to present him. Mm -hmm. This person really knew in Christ Jesus. One of the great weaknesses of our time is that conversion is is too shallow. Yeah. What's presented as conversion is too shallow. Just repeat after me. You know, and, they, and even sometimes when people make the good confession, confess Christ, they'll, they'll someone else will frame the words for them. They can just repeat mm -hmm. after me. And, it, and there's nothing really that confirms that the conversion is real. Mm -hmm. And the person who's converted needs to know it's real. Yeah. As well as the people around them. This leper would mean something to him if the priest said, Clean, mm -hmm. I went through all the technical procedures, I've examined it all, there's no evidence of leprosy anymore. That would be a great consolation to this man, too. Yeah. So you learn a little something about uh, Jesus there. That Jesus' work is thorough and it's good, but he wants it confirmed. That God has, in fact, done a great thing. Now... <clears throat> This man had an unwise response. He didn't, he didn't do what Jesus told him to do. Mm -hmm. In fact, the scripture says he went out and began to publish it much and blaze abroad the matter insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city. <laughs> it, got, it got so Jesus couldn't even preach in a town anymore. He had to go out in the desert places and preach. So it actually inhibited. It actually inhibited Christ's ministry. See, how could this be? Well, Jesus didn't come to be known as a leper healer. Yeah. He healed lepers, but that's not why he came. Mm -hmm. Elisha could heal lepers. Moses could pray for lepers. Mm -hmm. This isn't really why he came. I could, I could just almost see what happened. The place is flooded with people that had all kind of infirmities, could really maybe had no real interest in Christ himself. Yeah or what he came for, but it, it actually inhibited mm -hmm. Christ's ministry. Luke 1.15 uh, tells us, uh, uh, 5.15 tells us that Jesus went out of the desert quarters. He, he withdrew. He just went away. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something about Jesus that is not known very well. Maybe the Liggett Platt auditorium wouldn't be used so much on Easter if this was known. <laughs> But Jesus doesn't is not attracted to disinterested crowds. Amen. If you read the Gospels of this in mind, this will come across to you. Mm -hmm. That crowds don't mean that much to Jesus. In fact, there's been times he sent them away. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think sometimes as Jesus comes to some of these gatherings that are so highly touted, mm -hmm. touted, that he'd probably say, Well, I'm gonna clean this place out so we can just the people that are interested stay and we'll get down to doing some genuine things. Yeah. Jesus, that's not the way he is mm -hmm. at all. 
So it was unwise action. Now let's, uh, a few closing remarks here. Christ, uh, Christ's work is inhibited when what he emphasizes isn't emphasized. Yeah. I, I know that how glad a person is, like this man received his ankle bones, received strength when it's a lame man at the gate, beautiful, he was leaping and praising God. But it, it was in the temple. It, it was in the temple where the people had seen him sitting on the steps out there, lame, it's like a confirmation to them, you see. But you do not want the work of Christ, people's view of Christ, to be shaped completely by what he's done for you. You should tie in that what he's done to you is what he, whatever he do, is what he does to everyone. Yeah. It should be that kind of a testimony. Now here's a three conclusions. There is an advantage to pleasing Christ and appealing to His will. Mm -hmm. If you are a person who will walk as a dear child before God, He'll be more apt to answer your prayers than other people's prayers. <coughs> he does what He wants. And He is attracted to people who please Him and who are tender-hearted mm -hmm. toward Him. So there, second, there's a benefit to being... Dear children, yeah. there's a benefit to being able to appeal mm -hmm. to will of Christ. And third, there are those to whom Christ is attracted. Mm -hmm. There were times that he did have compassion on the multitudes. There, there, are, there are those times. Mm -hmm. And there's a time when he had compassion on one, per one person. In the multitude, one person. Mm -hmm. He had compassion on him. I, I offered you this suggestion. Strive to be that one person. That one person Amen. that he'll have compassion on. Seek him out and be where Christ is doing something. Amen. Be where he's doing something. And you're more apt to have things done for you. <clears throat>